Hi, my name is Leonard Facchinetti, and in this video, I want to talk to you about call CC. More specifically, we will briefly look at what it is and why it is a bad idea to have call CC in a programming language. And then we will derive together the type of call CC, which is weird, but super interesting. And this is one of those things that is relevant to you if you're interested in the deep corners of weird programming language features. Most programming languages don't even implement call CC, but it's something cool that I picked up when I was a graduate student studying programming language. Uh, I was doing a PhD in programming language theory and I picked this up and I think it's interesting, so I would like to share. So first of all, what should you know about call CC? Well, you should know that it's a terrible feature for a language to implement and for you to use. So even if your programming language has call CC, you should probably avoid it. Well, the reasons for that are many. The most important, I think, is that call CC leads to code that no one can read. In fact, here is something interesting. There is this program that is probably the most famous program that is using call CC. And in this program, uh, it's just counting, I guess it's counting numbers. I don't know exactly what it does, but it is uh, so weird that the person who discovered the program doesn't really understand how the program even works. So that's the kind of thing that you can do with call CC. And why is it a bad idea for a language to implement call CC? Well, there are many reasons, and this article is great and explains many of them, but it boils down to it is usually too slow and costly for a language to implement call CC. And of course, as I said, you can write code that no one can understand with call CC, so why would you include that feature in the language? But okay, so if there are all these negatives, why would someone implement call CC? Why would this feature even exist in the first place? Well, as a programming language theory person, it's kind of tempting to include call CC in your language because with call CC alone, you can implement any other feature that has to do with the control of your program. And by control, I mean things like if then else branches or for loops or recursion and, and function calls, all those things can be implemented in terms of call CC. So if you have a language that it's supposed to be very small, you can add call CC to the language and then implement everything else as libraries on top of call CC. Well, that doesn't really hold 100%. There are many caveats, and this article actually explains some of them. But in general, this is something that you can do. And if, if you have a small language that is not supposed to be used by humans, but just to showcase some theory that you are putting on a paper, then call CC may be good enough for you. You can just say, oh, this feature supports call CC, or more generally, this feature supports continuations and scaping continuations. And then everyone will agree that, oh, okay, if it supports call CC, then it supports any kind of control operator. So you don't have to explicitly implement conditionals, if then else, and loops, for and while, and repeat, and so on. And it's a simpler way of presenting ideas at the cost of making everything else more complicated. But anyway, okay, so that is what call CC is, and that it's those are the main claims to fame of call CC. There is yet another one, which I think is super interesting, and it has to do with its type. And the type of call CC is going to be the main topic of, our, of today's video. I will briefly explain call CC if you have no idea what's going on there, but the main topic of the video is the type of call CC. And this is the type of call CC in uh, languages that have something called Hindler Milner type systems. And those are languages like uh, ML, like OCaml, and Haskell, and other languages of that family. So that's the type of call CC. And this type is super weird but it is interesting for many reasons, one of which is it is a connection between two types of logic. And I'm talking here about mathematical logic, the field that studies the relationship between uh, statements and truth. And it is weird. I took a whole course of, about 
uh, mathematical logic and I remember very little of it. But anyway, there are multiple logics and they can reason about truthfulness of assertions in different ways. One of these types is intuitionistic logic and with intuitionistic logic, you have to construct truths. And that this, then there is this other kind of logic that is called classical logic. And they are different. Intuition, intuitionistic logic and classical logic are different. But if you take intuitionistic logic and you add call CC, you add this type to intuitionistic logic, it becomes classical logic, or at least you can do everything that uh, you can do in intuitionistic logic, everything that you could do in classical logic. So there is this relationship between the two, and the connection is call CC, and this weird type that we are going to look at. And this is also the type that you find, for instance, in Haskell that implements call CC. There are very few languages that actually implement call CC. Here in the Wikipedia article, there is a brief list, but there are very few languages that implement call CC, and some of them that implement call CC decided to move away from it. I think that Ruby used to implement it, but I think that the later versions of Ruby no longer have call CC because it's usually not used and it is complicated. Anyway, I don't think that Ruby has call CC anymore, but Haskell has it. And this is the type of call CC. You can see that it's similar to the thing in the Wikipedia article. Then there is also standard ML. I don't think that OCaml implements call CC, but standard ML does. And this is a similar type, except that they are calling this first part, they are calling it just a count, and they are not explicitly expanding it. And then uh, there are other languages that implement this, one of which is Racket. And that's the language that I am the most familiar with. So that's the language from, I mean, that's the language from this list that I'm the most familiar with. So that's the language we are going to use to reason about types. And yes, Racket, not typed Racket, but Racket proper is not statically typed. So there is no notion of types written in this manner. But we can always use that language to talk about call CC and reason about its type. So that's what we are going to do. So I'm going to take the type here and I am going to put it here as a comment. And then we will work our way up to derive this type and get it from first principles. So let's start with something like this. We don't know anything about the type of call CC. Let's start there. And let's start with an expression that doesn't even use call CC like this. Okay, so if I run this expression, then I get five. Now let's introduce call CC into this expression to learn something about its type. The thing I'm going to do is to just use call CC right here, call CC, and call CC expects as an argument a function. So I'm going to use the function, and this is racket notation to write a function. You can use the lambda letter. In other languages, you would use a keyword like function. And in Racket, you can actually say lambda explicitly, but I think it, read it reads better if you put it like this. It is the kind of fancy uh, mathematical writing that you would see on papers and whatnot. Anyway, so you call CC receives as argument a function, and this function uh, for now doesn't need to receive any arguments itself. We can just do it like this, and I think that we'll still get the same result. Oh, no, it actually needs an argument. So we'll call this argument continuation, and we'll look at what this argument is doing in a moment. But for now, you can see that the result is still the same. So what we are doing here is just wrapping the number three, which is an expression. We are wrapping the expression with a call to call CC. We're passing a function as an argument, and this function is simply returning are the, the result of our ori original expression. And this is something that always holds. If you wrap an expression in your program with a call to call CC, giving a function that immediately returns value, it's the same as the original expression you started with. That always holds. And yes, I will explain what call CC is doing in a moment, but hanging in there, it's gonna get complicated. But for now, with just this, 
we learned something about the type of call CC. We learned that call CC has a type such that it expects this argument at a, well, first of all, first of all, it's being called, it, it looks like a function call, so it will have one of these arrows that represents a function. So we don't know what is on the left, we don't know what's on the right, but we know that call CC looks like a function because it's being called. And that's another reason why I'm recording this video. The first is because I think call CC is interesting and I want to talk about its type. The second reason is I want to show this methodology for reasoning about the types of things. Because when you look at, especially if you're a newcomer, and you look at types like these, you're like, how do I even start? What is the point? How do I read this? Well, this is a way of reading this. It's a way of constructing the type and reasoning about it in steps. So that's something that I often do when I read a type that I don't understand. And I think it's a nice way of reasoning about the type. So that's why I'm doing this video to show you this process. Okay, so call CC is a function because it is being used as a function here. And that's the methodology. You use the thing and then you figure out the type by the way it's, the, the thing is used. And here the argument is a function. So we can, we know um, something about the argument. We know that it's a function. Right? And call CC is returning the number three. It must be because we are getting five as a result here. So we know that it returns a number. And that's the number three that is being added to two to produce this result of five. So that's as far as we went in terms of learning about what call CC is, about its type. I will also put here another call CC column. Next, let's transform this, in, this expression into something that actually uses this continuation argument to this function. So continuation is, it behaves like a function itself, so you can call it like this. When I run this, the result is still the number five, it's still the same. So what's going on here? Well, call CC is taking the rest of the program that has not run yet. So you can think of the rest of the program that has not run yet as this part, okay? So there is a hole in here, and this is the rest of the program that has not run yet. So it's taking the rest of this program that has not run yet, and it's assigning it to the continuation. So continuation is equal to that. When you call continuation, you can pretend that it is something like define continuation is a function. So let's say continuation, it's argument, let's give it a name X. You can pretend that continuation is defined like this. So this continuation argument is itself a function and it receives as argument um, something and then this something will be plugged into the hole that is the rest of the program. So this call CC thing is kind of magical because it's taking the rest of the program around it and it's wrapping it in a function that it passes to uh, the function that you call, that, that, that you pass as argument here. So it's taking the rest of the program, it can look around it's calling context, which is something unique, right? Think about all other functions you write. They can never look at the context in which they are called. They can always look at the arguments with which they are called, but they can never look at the context in which they are called. But call CC can do that. So it's taking the rest of the program as an argument, not really as an argument, but it's looking at the rest of the program, producing this function, and then passing this function as argument to the function that you call call CC with. And now you have it at your disposal. So yes, continuation is, is a function that looks like this. So continuation of three is two plus three, and that is five. So that's what's going on here. So now with that, we can continue reasoning about call CC. And now we learned that call cc is being called with a function. So the function I highlighted it is this one. This function is, it has an argument. So this 
continuation here that I highlighted, it, it relates to this question mark here. And this is function. So we are going to take this arrow and borrow it and like so. Now this is continuation and continuation is being called with a number. So we can say that this argument is a number. Next, I want to reason about what this, this function, not continuation, but this function itself is returning. And that's this question mark right here. Because remember, this whole thing, so essentially this arrow represents call cc. And the argument to call cc is this function that doesn't really have a name. But this function is this part, and it is represented by this arrow. Now we are interested in this question mark. What is this function returning? Well, to learn about that, we can use this other definition right here. So I'll put a number like six here. So what's going on here? Well, we are using the continuation. So this part is using the continuation. And this is a second and independent and unrelated expression. So if this was in other programming languages that are not Racket, we would have a semicolon here because this is using the continuation and discarding its result. And then we have another expression that is actually the return of this lambda, the return of this function. That lambda is how some people call functions, especially when they are in the racket tradition of Lisp and other schemes, scheme flavors. Anyway, so this function, lambda, is now returning a number. And what is the result of calling this? Well, now we have to reason about what call CC does. When we started using call CC, when we first introduced it, we learned that whatever the lambda, whatever this internal function returns, that's what call CC returns, and that's why the result of this expression was 5, because this was returning 3. So if that is the case, then this would return six. And the result of the program would be six plus two, eight. On the other hand, we looked at this version of the program in which we are using the continuation. And when we are using the continuation, I said that we are taking the rest of the program as if it were a function, and then we are calling it. So continuation of three is like calling continuation here with the number three, so three plus two is five. In that case, because we are calling continuation here, the result of the program would be five, which is the rest of the program, two plus with a whole, like so, like here. So three plus two, five. So is the result of the program eight or is the result of the program five? Well, let's run this. The, res the result of the program is still five. So when you call continuation, it's discarding the rest of the lambda. And that's something that is also unique about this continuation. It behaves like a function. You use it as a function. You're calling continuation here. But it's not really, really a function. It is a continuation. It's something else. It is this magical entity that when you call it, you are going to go away from where you are in the execution, you are going to forget about everything else you would have done, for instance, returning six, you're going to forget about it, and you're going to go into this continuation land, and you're going to call this function that is defined here, or you can pretend that it's kind of a function, you can start to reason about it as a function, though it really isn't. Anyway, you're going to go into this function call, and you're never coming back. So that's something else that is unique and weird about call CC. But anyway, with that, we learned that this whole function here returns, a, it can return a number, it should return a number, and this is an example of it returning a number. And now there is only one thing left for us to do, which is to reason about this. That is the result of calling the continuation. So here, this is a call to the continuation, so this is a call to this function over here, and it's receiving a number as an argument, we know that much. What is it returning? Well, we can reason about this by using a, a couple of expressions. So if you think that it's returning a number, then you can use zero. That's a function that takes a number. So if you call zero, 
with zero it returns true if you call zero with come on if you call zero with one it returns false and if you call zero with something else like hello then it gives you an error so this is a function that only accepts numbers and then there are things like string length and this thing only accepts strings and if you pass it a number then it gives you an error so you can try this and then in that case continuation is returning a number and you can try that and in this case continuation is returning a string or at least it should be if it's not then we will get an error when we run the program we can see that we are never getting any errors all the results are still the same the number five so the result of the continuation its return can be used as a number it can be used as a string it can be used as anything really and it always works it never fails that makes sense because as i said when you call the continuation this is not like a function call it will not return properly it will never get back here to this part of the code and execute string length or execute zero to potentially give you an error it's going to ignore the rest of this function body so this function body here as long as you call continuation the rest of its body will be ignored but from a type checker perspective you can think that zero and string length they are all valid so this could be a number this could be a string and so on so it could be anything really so in some cases it's a number but in some cases we can say that it's actually a string well actually it can be anything as i said so it can be a number it can be a string it could be a list it could be a boolean you get the idea it can be anything so we give it a name that is generic, a type that is generic, beta. And finally, to wrap this up, and I think you know where I'm going now, you can note that I'm not really doing anything specific to numbers in this whole thing. I could replace this operation with things that have to do with strings. So I could have zero huh, here, and then I could have something that does string concatenation, for instance. And that would be string append. And now when we are using numbers, so this is going to be like, uh, hello, space. And when I am using numbers, I should use strings instead. So hello world. And this six becomes not me. And now this time the result will be hello world, the concatenation of hello and world. So you can see that call CC, its type, it has nothing to do with numbers specifically. That was just a way of reasoning about it. It could be a string. As long as all these three agree, right? All these three are now uh, strings. This one, that one, and that one as well. So they are all three strings. They could be booleans, they could be lists, they could be whatever. So we are assigning them another different type variable. It is not the same as this one. Because now, for instance, we are doing things with numbers here. So this beta would be number in this case. So in general, that's the type of call CC. And there you go. We derived the type of call CC from first principles. Now, is this the whole story? No, it's not the whole story. We can still figure more things out about the type of call CC. So let's note something about Racket that is different from languages like ML and Haskell. In languages like ML and Haskell, if you have a conditional like this, if true, then you need to return two things from the then and else branches. So maybe they are like two numbers like so. And what's important in those type systems is that these two need to agree in type. So you cannot have a conditional like this if this if the then branch returns 23 and the else branch returns hello that is not valid in languages like ml and, ha and haskell 
or at least I think it's not valid in Haskell. I know ML, I don't know that much about Haskell. Anyway, so you can do this in Racket though. That is just fine. And that's because in Racket, there is no requirement that the then and else branches need to agree in terms of type. And this known requirement is pervasive in many other languages like Ruby and JavaScript and Python and Lua and so forth. So you can have these types disagree. And the reason why you cannot have that in languages like ML and, and Haskell, or at least ML, I'm going to say just ML from now on, or at least I will try, is that what could you do with the result of this conditional in ML? You can only use functions that are simultaneously going to work with numbers and strings. And there are none to few of them. I think that maybe there are no functions like that in ML. But in Racket, we can do things like write. And write, it takes as argument a number. It takes as argument a string. It doesn't really care. You can use write to do any of those, uh, to, to print any of those values. So and that's why we have that feature in Racket. You can have these two disagree in Racket. But in ML, I don't think that such a right thing exists. In ML, you have to use right or something equivalent to right string or right number, something like that. And then in that case, you have to be specific about the type you're passing. But that's not a requirement in record. So we could have something like this. So we could have something that uses a string all over, but not here, for instance. So here we could have a boolean, like false. That's how you write false in Racket. And that runs just fine. It still gives you the same hello world result. So in general, we could have a call CC in which this part, so this part, what is it here in our type? Well, we I have to reason about this from first principles again. So I have call CC, it's a function. Its argument is a function. And it's return now, this function, it's return, it's a boolean. So it's no longer an alpha, it's something like a gamma. And then the result of the continuation is, or being the, the, the thing that is being called, the continuation is being called with alpha. So alpha is a string in this case. Gamma is, uh, gamma is the a boolean in this case. Beta is a string in this case. And what does call CC return? Well, it returns, if we don't have a call to the continuation, if we don't have this expression here at all, it returns a Boolean, right? If we don't have this part, and this is how you comment out a whole expression in Racket. So the thing I highlighted is now commented out. In this expression, call CC returns a Boolean because um, this, lambda here that I have my cursor over, this lambda here returns that boolean. In fact, Dr. Racket is drawing an arrow to show me that false is the return of this lambda. So call CC itself is returning the boolean, which is gamma in this case. So it's returning gamma. And call CC could be returning um, this string here as uh, as well. In fact, you can pretend that it's returning this string in this case where, it, where I don't have this commented out because the rest of the program, the continuation is being called with alpha and that's what's actually running in this example. That's how we produce hello world. So in this case, we have a union of alpha and gamma. This union type, that's how this is called, is something that exists in some type systems, but not the type systems of ML. And I think also Racket. So this union type doesn't exist. It's not supported by these other type systems. And that's why things like this are not supported in these type systems as well. But there are other type systems that have this, fun this feature. Specifically, you can think of typed Racket, which is a language based in Racket, but it is typed, statically typed. So in typed record, the type of call CC is closer to this, but it gets way more complicated in reality 
this is the type of call CC in typed record. So you can see that there is a whole lot more going on here. And this is way beyond the scope of this video. I don't understand most of this myself. I won't even try to explain all this. But just so you know that this is not the end of the story. In fact, uh, Hindler Milner type systems are not the, the end of the story. There is a whole lot more you can think about in terms of types. And uh, this is the closest I can get to the real type of call CC in a language like type record. And that's it. That's all I have for you today. This is a brief introduction to call CC and how it behaves, but more specifically its type and a way for you to reason about types. I think call CC is an interesting curiosity, even though you should never use it in a real language or you should never use it in your language if you are in a language that has it. But in any case, if you're interested in programming and things about video editing as well, I do a whole lot of that in this channel, so make sure you subscribe. Thanks for watching. I see you on the next one. Bye-bye.